Thank you again, Pastor Josh. Last week's readings from Mark 8, we had, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And we have an artist's representations, a painting of that on uh, your bulletin of, of his second coming. And then from the first Peter reading, For it is time for the judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And last week we talked about the persecution, the fiery trial, the things that Christians will go through or can go through, the different flavors of what that looks like. And remember, as I ended, there are many ways that the enemy can try to test you, test your faith, to try to destroy you physically, mentally, and spiritually. But when that fiery trial comes, the Spirit tells us, it helps us to remember not to be surprised that this is happening, not to be confused when it does happen, and to rejoice because not only can we endure all of that hideousness, but we do so in the name of the Lord. That, that is the only thing worth enduring for. And you can endure it because you are in Christ and Christ is in you. And so this week, again, as a soft continuation, we're going to read about that glory, the promised reward for endurance, and ultimately why we look to Christ's second coming. So hear now the second reading from Revelation 21, 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned from her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death. The word of the Lord. So this week's very, we, reading is very much the other side of the coin. The trial and tribulation that happens on the earth, but then the promise to us after Christ comes again. And so we see God's promise to us in these, this reading. We see the promise to the ones who conquer trial, who conquer tribulation, who hold to their faith and then their beliefs in the Lord. And two weeks ago, I believe, we saw that there will be those that entice you away, that try to tempt you into sin, to pull you away from the faith. And those who will persecute you, as from last week. And so, while you're thinking about these wonderful descriptions... You may say, hey, pastor, life's pretty good right now. I'm feeling pretty blessed. I don't feel trial. I don't feel tribulation. It is pretty good. And I'm thankful for that, but I just, maybe this doesn't connect with me. It doesn't seem as uh, a wonderful fruit. And I would say to you two things. One, I would like you to go read the first couple chapters of Job and how a man who had everything, how quickly that can change, how fast our lives can change. 
how on one day we are up and we are filled with the Spirit, and then the next day we are out in the wilderness, hungry, being tempted by Satan. And then number two, regardless of your belief in God, whether you sit in these pews or whether you're at home right now, not watching online, but home, ignorant of church, ignorant of God, no one gets spared from life. No one gets spared from the, this fallen world, from trial, like a loss of a job, from tribulation, like enduring a bad diagnosis from cancer or some other health issue. These are all effects of living in a fallen world, from evil. And evil can come to us in many different forms and fashions. I know each one of you can think of a time where you've brushed shoulders with somebody who was evil, somebody who wanted to manipulate you, take, steal, accuse, deceive, cause harm. And from death, no one gets spared from death. The loss of family, the loss of friends, the loss of coworkers. And so, even if you are feeling pretty blessed right now, know that the realities of this fallen world still exist. It is going to happen. But the Lord promises us some things. Things that we need to be remember, brought to remembrance about. That we need to edify each other. It's why we read the word. It's why we study. It's why we walk the path. He can see us through those things. He can see us through those trials. He can see us and help us. And we can glorify him by putting faith in that, for accepting that health, that help, and showing to the world that we have trust in our great provider. And we can glorify him by walking through those trials, through those tribulations. And today we are talking about the promises the Lord makes for not just our individual time of trial, but the time of trial, the tribulation, the big evil, the great death. And so let's go through line by line to see what those promises look like in Revelation 21. First verse, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Don't worry, John, I got it. So I'm going to put that up right now. The first heaven and the first earth. You see, you see this sort of transition. You got fire on one side and then a, maybe a new heavenly thing, but a, an idea of a new, something new and something old. And you might ask, well, what was wrong with the old? Why can't utopia happen here right now? Why can't we just do the right things on earth? Why can't we just make this happen? I kind of like the way it is here right now. As I said, maybe you feel blessed. Maybe you don't know what's going on around you in other people's lives. But remember that this is a heaven where Satan could enter and challenge God over Job. This is a heaven where the devil can make war on, can knock stars down. That's the heaven that has passed away. This is the earth where war and famine and pestilence and death seize our fear, seize our attention. This is the earth where the wicked have yet to be punished. This is the earth where the saints are going to be persecuted. So as I talked about last week, that persecution, that trial, that, that earth will pass away. That heaven will pass away. And this is the new earth. This is the new heaven. And that's our focus, the promise that we have as servants of God. And so... He continues, And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now, before I jump into this passage, I want to remind everyone that these slides that I use are to inspire you, but not to cage you. They're definitely not to cage God's glory. These are artist representations of what we think it might look like or what it possibly looks like, or what another person thinks of. But don't let that confine God's glory, your understanding. This is just to help inspire. And so I put up this slide. Here's uh, an artist's rendition of John describing New Jerusalem. In the new heaven and the new earth, God prepares New Jerusalem. 
Now, do I think it will look like a Roman or Greek city? I don't think so. I just think that that's this person's interpretation. But it's prepared as a bride. Ladies, I hope you all remember your wedding day. Or if you hadn't had a wedding day, maybe you've been a maid of honor or uh, another person helping out the wedding. So you can see, you know what that is all about. But I, as a man, do not have to watch Bravo to know, or any other reality TV shows for that matter, that the wedding day is important and great care and preparation go into that day. It's definitely a shower day for the groom and for the bride. It's definitely get your hair done, get your makeup done, nails, maybe a little tan beforehand. Dress is definitely prepared. And that can be modest, that can be extravagant. But that day is different than all other days. And you can say, you know, that's a little over the top to do that much preparation for a wedding day. I'm more simple than that. And that's fine. You may be more simple. But this is God we're talking about. You better believe the creator of all creation is going to go all out on preparing something as a bride. No, nothing will be held back because he is going all out for that bride, for the new Jerusalem that he is preparing for his people. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Here's another depiction of what that might look like. Is that what it's going to look like? No, not at all. It'll be better. It'll be more glorious. But still, help understand what we're talking about with the description John is giving us. Verse 3 is my favorite verse of this passage. If I have to pick favorites, it's all good. But this promise he makes here, of the three promises he goes through, is what I hope to be, what I strive to be, my daily focus. It is the relationship with God. It is being with God, a part of Him, being with Him, walking with Him. Because this is where we can see glimmers of final glory in our daily life. It's the preview we get as believers. Because we have, as a believer, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We can get a sense of that. We can get a preview when we see it in others, especially in times of tribulation. This happens when a godly man or godly woman steps into the breach, steps into their godly purpose, and the Spirit of the Lord is on full display. It shows up at the hospital and delivers holy words to the ill, and you can see it on display. It stands up against evil, at schools, or in the office place. And you can see it on display. And these days, that evil can come in student size or faculty size packages. But you can see the servants of the Lord being consistent throughout. Oh, looks like Miss Margaret forgot to turn off her cell phone. <laughs> and so, well... We'll wait a moment. Jeanette, thank you. (laughs) But witnessing that, witnessing the Spirit of the Lord, whether it be a strength that you did not know you had, a word of prayer for somebody who needed it, somebody in the body of Christ that you observe can reveal that preview, can show you God's work for a moment or a minute or an hour, however long it's happening. And this is beautiful. It's David against the diagnosis. It's Elijah against the in crowd. It's Christ risen in the face of the tomb. And we get to see that. It is revealed to us. We get to enjoy that. We get to taste that daily if we just look for it, if we believe in it when we see it. 
But that's still a preview. We're still here on a fallen world. But God knows. God wants, God desires the dwelling place of Him to be with man. To be in that presence of His Spirit always. Where we are not estranged. We're not in pain. And this is His desire for us. This is His desire for His people. To live with Him to dwell with him. And it ends with God himself will be with them as their God. Worship, glory, relationship. This is the first promise, but it's the, also the biggest promise that I focus on. Because that's the foundation. Our relationship with the Lord. And again, amen to him being our God. Amen to having that relationship with the Lord. And then it goes on to say, in verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Now some of you may have heard of the, the genocide in Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge gained power. They attempted to make it a socialist utopia. They were in charge of making the new earth. They were in charge of cleaning house to bring glory upon this world in their own eyes. Enemies of the state, the religious, the foreigner, a total destruction of people. Your friends, your family, your church brutally murdered. Or maybe you don't want to imagine that. Maybe that's too hard to look at. Woman crying over her husband. But I guarantee you, you have and will have, again, cried bitterly at loss. The loss of a child, the loss of a spouse, the loss of a parent, the loss of a friend, the loss of your own health, maybe the loss of your innocence. These are things that we weep over, that we are in pain, that we have tears for. And what God is promising here is that he will wipe away those tears. He will take that pain. The former things, the things that which you have endured, will pass away. The pain of those things will cease. And so that is his second great promise. It's not just forgiveness of sin and eternal life, but also the relief of pain from these former things. The wiping of tears. And then he goes on to say, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. We see a painting of John here, taking notes, writing down exactly what the Lord is telling him, what the angel is telling him, what he's seeing, his visions, he's putting them together. Because these words are trustworthy and true. He's also usually ducking. Like he's, he's very low in these paintings. Which is understandable. He's seeing and hearing a lot of disturbing things. Hopeful things. Glorious things. And so he can see he's kind of down. Writing these words that are true. But God is instructing John to write these down as a true promise. That not only in the gospel are we promised eternal life and forgiveness of sins, but also a relief from that pain. The pain of the former things. And that's not just for him, but for all of us in this church today, so we can hear it. And thank God and give us hope that the things that we struggle with, the things that ache in our hearts, the thorns in our side, the suffering we endure for the Lord, that we will have relief from that. As our first reading said, after the trial or the tribulation had passed, after these things had gone, this is what happens. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And here we see a repeat of a promise 
but also a knowing of who God is. He was at the beginning and He will be at the end. He is eternal. He is greater than we. And He's given us so many helps, lifts up, direction, guideposts, lamps, prophets. He gave us His Son. And so when He speaks, He speaks the truth and He does not change His tune from the beginning until the end. And so we see that repeat of the promise we have seen before that, the God, that God speaks of, that Jesus Christ speaks of, that the Holy Spirit professes. The eternal life with the Father is not for sale. But as it was written, it was paid for by Christ and given to us freely. Amen. They who accept the water of life, accept Christ, they do so without payment. This isn't an exchange of goods. This isn't a checklist of chores or works to do in order to receive it. This is having faith in your heart, in God, turning and receiving what has already been bought and it is now a free gift to you. And thank goodness, thank God, because we saw throughout all the Old Testament that we cannot live up to His standard. There is nothing that we can do that will ever pay that price. We heap up sin on top of our shoulders daily. But the Lord made it possible. The Lord has always been good, has always guided His people, has always made promises and kept them. And so the one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be His God and He will be my Son. We did a uh, series the churches of Revelation, the churches had issues, as all churches have issues. Not churches, families, or towns, nations. Churches had trials. They did some good things. They still had sinful behavior. They become apathetic or blind, or they fell out of love. And so we are asked, we were called, we are shown that the one who repents who keeps pursuing after God, will conquer that and will be given reward. And we see that here again. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. Job, who graced our bulletin last in desolation, stripped of everything, in pain and suffering, looking up to God. The trial and tribulation we talked about last week. to persist through the call to endure, to pick up our cross and carry it daily. And we saw Job, who had everything, all of a sudden be taken away. His friends saying, well, it was probably because you were sinful, or it was probably because this, all guessing the nature of God, when then finally Elihu and God himself comes down and rebukes the whole of them and say, how dare you assume the plan? How dare you assume the sin of another person to guess and to judge, to judge God about his plan, but to have faith, to weather through. Because God tells us over and over and over again, not just in the Old Testament, not just in the Gospel, but also the epistles and in Revelation, to conquer, to, to have faith and persist through to endure through that fiery trial. And his promises will be yours. And you will be adopted into the family of God. You will get to see, where is that? The shiny city. You'll get to be in relationship with him. The pain, the suffering that is temporal, that is finite, that is just for this life will be wiped away. To be a part of the glory, to feel it, to see it, to be in relationship with that. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, what do they have in store? Again, not what it'll look like, but an artist's representation. I'm going to focus on cowardly out of this list of murderers and sexually immoral and sorcerers and idolaters and liars. They all go there or someplace like it. 
But again, our human limitations can never truly depict what that will be like. But the cowardly are those ashamed of Christ. That's what we talked about last week. Those unwilling to share the good news for fear of the word, or the world, excuse me, and not fear of the word, fear of God. They have a fearfulness of what will happen to them in this world. I have a number of friends that are taking ordination exams right now in other denominations. I hear reports every year about, well, if I just say the right thing and I don't say what I believe, I will get through the ordination, I will get the job, and then I can do what I like. That is cowardice at a measure I can't even fathom. Because when you are being tested, when you are being asked about your beliefs, you hide. You close off where your heart is. You close off calling God a he or a him because that might ruffle feathers. You change the word to suit those giving the test. And that is cowardice. And that can come in other places too. It can come with a family member at a dinner table. It can come in a workplace. It can come at a school board meeting. It can come, if you're younger, at a lunch table. Come on the playground and come in places where all of a sudden you see something that is wrong and God puts on your heart what is right, but you are too afraid of what they will say, of what might befall you, than to actually live into the word that you know is true. And so, no, not just the false teachers teaching sexual immorality, but also the cowards who pull punches who are afraid of Goliath, of who are afraid of the enemy, more than they are afraid of God, more than they believe in what is true. And so those who say, I will say what I need to say, might be against the word, but I will get through. I'll get ordained. I'll get the job. I'll get to go on a date with somebody. I'll get to have this opportunity doesn't matter if I'm being, you know, duplicitous, deceptive. Not just to those in front of me, but to my own relationship with God. And their portion will be the lake of fire. And I know we've all had moments. We all have been convicted of this. Lord knows I've stood in the shower more than on enough occasions and washing my hair going, I didn't live up to it. I was cowardly. I didn't say what I needed to say. I know that I was wrong in that moment. But do you repent of that? Do you confess to that? Do you go back and say, I was wrong? And that's something we all struggle with. But what God is saying here, the ones who embrace that cowardliness, the ones who don't repent of it, the ones who don't grow that relationship, So that way you don't say to yourself, oh, I screwed up. I was definitely a coward in that moment. Instead of asking for forgiveness, repenting, and saying, Lord, show me how to not do that again. Lead me down the path where I do not make that choice again. Help me in those moments. Because I want to have a relationship with you. I want to see your glory. I want to be a good servant. And for, when we talked about this in Bible study beforehand, for the rest of the world, they think we're nuts. They don't see what we see. They don't have the revelation of God. They don't know that eternity is on the line. They don't see value in following the Lord. They logic themselves into something or they reason or they you know, emotionally are driven in a certain way. But all those paths lead to being cowardly, detestable, and doing unspeakable things. But what we have promised to us as covenant people is a relationship, is that pain that is temporary going away eternally. And that is what we must focus on. That is what must be called to our remembrance when we are going through those fiery trials. When our faith is being put and tested 
And so while we are here, he sends us out to evangelize, to pray, to preach, to baptize, to glorify him. And during those times, we can see his glory. We've witnessed it in our own lives. And to remember when pain and suffering befall his people, he is here with us. He is with us until the end of the age. And he promise us, promises us in those moments, those dark moments, that our relationships in the presence of the Lord is not only what he wants for us, but awaits for us on the other side. That the pain that you're going through, the pain of this world, will be healed by him. I know you're weary. I know the load seems impossible. But God tells us that his eternal life with him is given freely and is paid for by Christ. Our admission is already there for us. We just have to turn to it. Have faith the size of a mustard seed. And that mountain will move. That mountain will be thrown into the sea. That Goliath will be toppled. The angry and rebellious prophets will find no purchase. Christ will rise. He will ascend. And that is the promise of glory to us all. And so... When the sending is done, when the evangelism is done, when the praying is done, when the preaching is done, when the baptisms are done, when we are done glorifying him out in this world, he will call us home. The sending will turn into calling. To his prepared city. When our race is finished, we will go to a place with him. When he calls you home, He will call you to a place where the enemy has no reign. When he calls you to his side and the former things, the things that beat us down, the things that broke our hearts, the things that left us scarred, those all will be wiped from our eyes. And we can look forward to that day. In our darkest hour, we can look forward to that day. And from now until the end of the age, we will have faith in those promises, no matter how dark it gets. If the sun and the moon, the lights in the day and the lights in the night disappear, we can always believe and have faith in the light of our Lord. And right now, you might be going through a struggle, right now, today. Or maybe you are blessed and you're having a great Sunday. There's nothing troubling you. But no, we all go through trial. We all go through tribulation. And know that the Lord and all of his glory is not only at your back, but it is also in front of you. Let us pray.